Hey, how are you? Hey, I am doing okay. Uh, yesterday was my oldest son's 20th birthday. So, Ooh. yeah, it's kind of crazy. A new decade, new, all sorts of things. So I'm excited for him and where he's at and what he's working toward. And it was fun to celebrate him and spend some time together as a family. So, yeah, feeling really good about that and super excited to dive in today and be recording. Yeah, it's been year. I can't believe it. We finally had a pretty snow day this morning. So it was just enough snow to have like covered the grass, but it isn't messing up any of the roads. And it was snowing those big thick flakes that you can see in the air. They almost like hang in the air. Yeah. Uh, it was just so picturesque, not interruptive of the commute at all. And so I am just loving the weather here in Missouri today. It's just so beautiful. That is fantastic. I'm yeah, glad you're experiencing that. Yeah, me too. Those are the moments I love being somewhere where there's like rolling hills and the like periodic falling down barn in the middle of the open field with the like one tree next to it. There are probably four different places I pass that scene driving from my home to my office and every one of them i want to just stop and take a picture especially on a day like today when it is snowing it's just gorgeous yeah i feel the same way when our community gets uh snow it's so pretty and to see all the mountains around us just covered in snow is just awesome mm. and well i'm guessing however you did not all to talk about snow. <laughs> no, I did not. I'm actually really excited. So we had a conversation last week about three different types of churches, right? The father churches, the son churches, and the spirit churches. And I thought that was such a fun conversation. And I'm really looking forward to diving into a text today and see if you wouldn't mind exploring it with me in light of those three churches. Mm, that sounds awesome. I'm super curious which text. Yeah, so this is John 14, and this is where Jesus says something that I think each of these churches interprets differently. So this is John 14, and I'm going to start us in verse 11. And Jesus says, believe me when I say that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or at least believe on the evidence of the works themselves. Very truly, I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing and will do even greater things than these because I am going to the Father. And it's that greater things or greater works that I'd really love to just dive into. Yeah, I would love to talk about this. As a matter of fact, because I happen to be reading through John right now, I literally read this chapter this morning uh, oh, wow. in my time with God. So this is perfectly timed, and I am super excited to have this conversation. I'm curious, what made you pick this particular text? Well, so... In our church, we are going through the book of John, and we're doing it a couple of verses at a time. And then we're often pausing the sermon series to incorporate other little mini series along the way. And so this has been a multi-year process of going through the book of John. And we recently, uh, we recently preached on this topic. And I'm part of our church's sermon prep team. So when we came to this and we got prepared for the pastor to preach it, we all sat in a room talking about, well, what does this mean? And it became evident that depending on which circle you felt comfortable in, you had a slightly different interpretation of this. So for those who haven't caught our three different types of churches episode, father churches are very doctrinally oriented. They're very high on the Bible and scripture and good theology. And then 
Sun churches are very active in their communities. They're the hands and feet of Jesus. They're serving. And then spirit churches are very intent on having an active encounter with the Holy Spirit. And so all three of these things influence, I think, how we might read what does Jesus mean by, quote, greater works. So that's the context that I'm coming to it from. Ah, I think this is really interesting. I'm So I'm curious, you mentioned in our conversation about that, that you land generally in the Baptist sort of father church tradition. And so I'm curious to hear a little bit about where you take this text. I land somewhere else and I know how my tradition takes this text, but I'm really curious where a right doctrine, right theology kind of person, what do you see in this text? Yeah, I, I'll i go ahead and answer that here in just a moment. I want to say, first of all, that I don't know that there is a right doctrine about this. I think that there is definitely a slant that my type of church would lean toward, and so I'm happy to talk about that. But I don't want to appear as though I'm coming to this conversation with final conclusions. Like, this is genuinely like an open wrestling, because I'm not sure that my tradition has all the answers when it comes to this text. No, this is a great point. This is one of the things that I love about our conversations about Scripture, is that they are not pre-programmed. We don't have an end in sight that we're trying to get to. We are genuinely trying to have a kind of wrestling conversation in which we try to see what the Bible is trying to say to us. And this process of conversation, for me at least, has become a major part of the way that I meditate on Scripture because of our conversations. Oh, interesting. How do you think our in, our conversations have impacted that? You know, I think back to when I was first starting ministry, I was getting coaching and I was having to work through a particular project. And I was sitting down at my desk every day, banging my head against the wall, trying to figure out solutions. And in conversation with my coach, I started to realize that some of my best thinking happens in conversation with other people. And so since that time, one of the things I've actively tried to do is if something is important to me, I want to find space for conversation about it. Because there's something profound that happens in conversation in which the whole becomes more than the sum of its parts. And particularly in our conversations about Scripture, we often get to these aha moments where we realize something about the text that neither of us would have realized on our own. Yeah. And that, for me, is what meditating on Scripture is all about, seeing the text differently. And what better way to see the text differently than to talk to somebody who's not me? <laughs> right? Yeah, right. Otherwise, I just get into this sort of self-reinforcing loop in my head. Yeah, for sure. And I think, well, gosh, so many, so much of what you said clearly resonates with me. We've been having these conversations with one another for 20 years. And I think it was the consistency with which we had these like aha moments in conversation that made us think about actually making this into a podcast and saying, how about we have mm -hmm. some of these conversations and invite other people to the table, one, to be able to share and maybe even record for ourselves what those aha moments were, but also to invite others into the conversation to expand those aha moments. Because as much as it is helpful to talk with another person, you and I have been having these conversations for 20 years and have clearly influenced one another's thinking. And so as time goes on, it is less and less like talking with another person. <laughs> yes. yes, this is always apparent when we get together for vacations or things like that. And throughout the week, some child, your or mine, will say something to the effect of, huh, my dad would have said the exact same thing. Yes, uh, yes. Uh, because we have 
come to think the same way. And so you're right. We needed to expand the conversation in order to really stretch ourselves. Yes. Yeah. But I will say, even with the way that we've influenced one another, I think these conversations are wildly productive for me. And and I always come away with something so unique. So I'm actually, I never know, like when we sit down and we record and it's like, I don't actually know where this episode is going to go. And so I hope it's good. So I feel like that again, yeah. right? Here we go. We're going to yeah. dive into this text. I have no idea what's going to happen. Yeah, no, absolutely. I'm super excited. Uh, so with that caveat successfully made, <laughs> tell me what your initial take on this text is. Yeah, I think that there's kind of this internal reaction, knowing that the Pentecostal movement has largely interpreted this in terms of spiritual gifts and signs. So these greater works, I kind of go, wait a minute, hang on. It can't be just that. In fact, I don't think much about the context requires that. I think it allows for it for sure, but it feels more holistic than that. And so obviously my tradition downplays the significance of the Holy Spirit's role or the Holy Spirit's gifts. And so we have kind of an automatic inclination to say, okay, clearly there must be something theological going on here. And Jesus must be meaning what? And so we start looking at the context and we start looking at the text and we start really dissecting this and, and saying, okay, well, these greater works is just, you know, how Jesus lived. Or, you know, I heard somebody say it this way. This is like very the epitome of a Baptist answer. I don't know who to attribute this to, so uh, I apologize. But somebody said, you know, if a neurosurgeon does brain surgery, that is a pretty miraculous work. But if I do brain surgery, that is even more miraculous. And I think that's what they're they're getting at. This We're doing the same things that Jesus did, but we're doing it while not being God. And so that makes it greater. And so it doesn't take Jesus's life and works and, and amplify it in any way. And it doesn't isolate it down to just the miraculous. I think it softens it a lot. And I don't know if that's right or wrong, but that's where my tradition starts. Mm. Yeah, I would struggle with that. It seems like that's making the works they are subjectively greater, not objectively greater. Wow, this is amazing because of who did it. It's not the work that's greater. It's the whole sort of package uh, being greater because it was done by a lesser person. Yes, right. Yeah, that's interesting. That is not at all where my brain goes. And and to be honest, my initial response is that can't be it, which is exactly why we have these conversations because then I have to like pause and give myself the space to wrestle with why do I react so strongly and then acknowledge that if this is something a bunch of godly people think, maybe there's something there for me. And, you know, so it it's refining and I can feel it happening inside of me because I, I wanted to jump down your throat when you described that. Um, <laughs> like that, I think, says far more about me and my lack of maturity than it does about your answer, to be quite frank. Well, I, you know what it does is it just explains why our friendship has taken place with 2,000 miles between us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that we didn't kill each other. Um, yeah. So there you go. How to have a good friendship. Never be in the same room. <laughs> right. You know, I've heard people say the same thing about marriage, which is interesting. Oh, that's you a know. different episode. Yeah. No, we'll have to do that a different time. But I think that's really interesting. You know, I... I what I thought you were going to say, which I dislike just as much, is that the greater work was salvation. Well, okay, so I've heard that as well. But why do you dislike that? Because that seems like the greatest work of all. Because calling it the greatest work of all seems like making excuses. We're not really raising people from the dead. So let's call this thing that we can do the greatest work of all. That's how it feels to me. And I don't even land fully in the like, I think in this verse, I actually land more in the Pentecostal camp 
than I do in a lot of other places. And so I would kind of give a very Holy Spirit answer to this. But yeah, it just comes off like making excuses. If Jesus wanted to say, you're going to introduce people to the kingdom of heaven, it feels like there's better ways he would have said it than this. But what if he's trying to communicate? Because this is like just before he dies, right? He's really setting his disciples up for his pending death and resurrection. And all throughout the discussion that he has, I mean, if you have a red letter Bible, chapters 14 through 17 are almost all red letters. And so Mm -hmm. Jesus is talking a lot or praying a lot. And all throughout that, he is anticipating his upcoming death and resurrection. And so what if he's trying to set up his disciples to say, you think this ministry time was great. You think this time we've had together was great. Just wait until the Holy Spirit comes and I go to the Father and you are going to actually be able to bring my salvation to the rest of the world. I can't do that this side of the cross. I think maybe my concern there is the same you have for the the Pentecostal answer. There's nothing in the text. How did you say this? You said this very, very well. There's nothing in the text that requires that, but the text certainly allows for that, right? Mm -hmm. You said something like that about the miraculous. Right. And then you said something to the effect of, I think maybe something more holistic is happening here. And I think that ultimately is my reaction to the salvation answer. As I look at this text, and my reading of it is deeply colored by the fact that I've been reading through John recently, reading it in the message, but there are a couple of things that have struck me about John's gospel and about these chapters in particular. The first is that the initiating incident of these chapters back in 13, because 14 starts mid-conversation, but not your heart be troubled is the middle of a conversation. He isn't just saying that randomly. No, because he's talking about his death. No, he's not. He's talking to Peter. He just told Peter, hey, you're going to deny me three times. And Peter's like, I would never do that. And he said, yeah, you're going to do it before the cock crows. And don't let your heart be troubled. And he broadens it out very quickly because he's more broadly talking about his death. But I think that context is very interesting because the very context of the whole of launching into all of this spiel is the inadequacy of the disciples. Right? Like this is this goes from one of you is going to betray me and you Peter the top dog are going to abandon me. So let's talk. Well, no, I actually see it differently. So I go back to 1331. My children, I will be with you only a little longer. You will look for me, and just as I told the Jews, so I tell you now, where I'm going, you cannot come. So he's talking about his death, and that's when Peter was like, no, never. And he's like, yeah, dude, even you aren't going to like follow through with this. And then he comes back to, don't let your hearts be troubled. I think Peter was reacting against Jesus's impending death in a way that the rest of the disciples were reacting, like, no way, this could never be. No, I I think you're right. I think that's a fair point. I think what captures me about all of this, Jesus is saying all of this against the backdrop of his own death and the limitedness of his followers, right? Like, he is not saying the hope of the world rests on you. Hmm. You're going to be successful. You're going to win. You know, our, the way we preach the gospel sometimes, let me back up, that's a little too broad. Sometimes evangelicalism might preach the gospel in a very self-help, success-oriented sort of way. Jesus here is preaching a different gospel, one in which he's going to get crucified and his followers are going to fail. So how do you see this promise of greater works fitting in? Because that also feels very self-helpy or victorious language kind of stuff. So this is interesting. This is where I find the three circles 
rubric to be incredibly intriguing in offering answers. So I am clearly ensconced in a Holy Spirit tradition. You are ensconced in a father tradition. If we both look over at the son tradition, here's the way I think son tradition people would take this text. And I think it offers us something. Jesus saw the work that the father was doing and continued it or, or did it. All through John, I just do whatever I see my father doing. I just do whatever I see my father doing. I yeah. say the words my father is saying. Like, right, this is a running theme for John mm -hmm. in which he is working out what we have ultimately would call Trinitarian language, probably in greater depth than any of the other gospel writers. Yeah, precisely. And part of what I think is happening here maybe is that greater works on some level, are broader. What do we see the Father doing? What do we see the Son doing? Well, the ultimate thing we see the Son doing is laying down his life sacrificially. The Son churches, I think, would ultimately claim that what we are empowered to do and the greater works are the proliferation of sacrifice that the church is able to do under the leadership of Jesus that allows real ministry to happen and real redemption to happen. The greater work is millions of people taking up their cross and following him in legitimate, sacrificial, costly, painful ways. I think that's what Sun Churches would say. Well, that brings us back to this really ambiguous word, greater, right? Mm -hmm. Does greater mean bigger? Does greater mean better? Does greater mean more miraculous? Does greater mean more tied to enacted salvation history? Or does greater mean a greater quantity, which is something of what I think you're trying to say? Yeah, I think this is a great question. It's maybe a greater question. Um, that was apparently a failed joke. That's too bad. I really thought that was a good one. I um, I half grinned, but not that the audience is going to pick up on my grin over here. No, it's all right. It's all right. You know, even the greatest humorists among us fail once in a while. And some of us have just practiced the art of failing more often than them. Um, <laughs> but I think greater is such a fascinating word for Jesus to use here. You'd expect it to be the same. You will do the same kinds of works that I am doing. Yes, that would feel way more, I don't know, it yeah. was just, I would be able to understand that a lot better. Greater throws me for a loop. Well, and I, this is jumping into, can I just go ahead and share my thought here because it may be relevant? No, that's completely against the podcast rules. I know, I know. <laughs> and my love of structures and systems is really making it complicated. Um, yeah, yeah. But, if I can just get an indulgence this one time, one of the things that I've been thinking about from my coaching work is how often, as a coach, if you are a good coach, you can cultivate trust with the people you're coaching. If you're a great coach, you can cultivate trust and then say things that are intentionally disruptive, designed to entirely mess up the other person's way of thinking in order to give them the space to recreate a new way of thinking, a new way of seeing the world. Mm. And that disruptiveness, that, that disruption that great coaches can accomplish, sometimes through a question, sometimes through a simple statement, seldom through anything very complicated, my wondering is how often Jesus is doing this. How often is Jesus being intentionally disruptive in order to help us clear away our old ways of thinking, in order to give us the space to have a new way of thinking? And if that is something Jesus does, which I think it is, like a lot, this feels like one of those. Yeah, I, I, this is definitely a disruptive text, right? This is definitely something that kind of jars us. But then, you know, which is common to our society, I think we 
go back to our echo chambers, in our case, these three different types of churches, and we start interpreting it through our own lens and I think fail to really give it the space to ponder that maybe Jesus intended. But Mm -hmm. I also kind of feel like maybe this is wrong. Maybe this is my own bias here. But yes, I think Jesus intended for us to chew on this as he did so many of his parables and his teachings. He doesn't resolve a lot of these. He just kind of lets it sit out there for us to chew on. But I do think there's a destination he's trying to get us to arrive at once we have sufficiently pondered all of this. And I still don't know what the end goal is here. Well, and this is where, so if I can throw out a painfully Sunday school answer. (laughs) All right. And here's where it's coming from. Jesus' method of teaching in the parables the way that I read his explanation for why parables is something like this. He taught the crowds in parables, and whenever anybody pushed in close to him and said, what the heck does that mean? He would explain it. And I think the parable was designed so that the people who weren't going to get it weren't going to get it, and so whatever, fine. But for every once in a while, there'd be somebody who'd push in and press for an answer, and they would get it. Not through some sort of like uh, set of mental mind games, but through coming to Jesus. That was what the parable was for, to force a conversation. I wonder if the hope for consequence in Jesus' mind of a text like this isn't for us to think rightly or to think differently, or perhaps for us to pray differently. What if the point here is for us to be willing to come to Jesus and say, and literally say in prayer, I don't know what this is supposed to mean, but please lead my life in this direction, whatever that means. Yeah, I definitely think we're inching toward healthier ground there. I want to be able to open my mind enough and open my heart enough for God to answer that however he wants to. Because I think if I'm being honest, my father tradition has so excluded the miraculous or the encounter with the Holy Spirit that I fear, like as I pray that prayer, it's almost like the God send me to anywhere, but don't send me to Africa kind of prayer. It's Mm -hmm. lead me here. Just don't make me one of those weirdos that rolls in the aisles. Yeah, no. And I think... I think on some level, the value of a verse like this is we are revealed in it, right? Not just in what we ask for, but what we ask against, right? Mm. I, I, it's so revealing what we say, God, anything you want, but please not this. Right. And I think part of the prayer has to be, God, help me be open to the thing I don't want which is really hard. Like I can think of specific things in my life I do not want God to have me do, at least one of which is far more private than I'm going to say on a podcast. Uh, Well, and you've done this a number of times. You've asked this specific question. I think it's such a good question. Does this text mean what I don't want it to mean? Yeah. And I think that's where, you know, we may need to broaden our understanding of confession. I think confession has to involve, God, I don't want to think this. I don't want to do this. I am currently unwilling to do this. Please have mercy. And if you want me thinking or doing those things, please help me get there. You know, this is where I get to the, I believe, help me overcome my unbelief. Mm, Yeah, 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 yeah. Right? Like. God, I, I don't want to be open, but I I want to want to be open. And maybe that just shows off that I'm a really weak person. And, and if it does, so be it. But at least I want to be transparent with that weakness in my prayer. Hmm. This is so good. And in the name of trying to open ourselves up, 
I want to make sure we've given full voice to some, uh, at least an interpretation from each camp. And I think the one we're missing so far has been uh, your own. And I'd love to hear from a spirit church kind of perspective, how might this passage be interpreted? Yeah, I think we've played around with it and assumed it. And I don't think we assume it inaccurately. A healthy Pentecostal Holy Spirit kind of church is going to hope and expect that God can do the miraculous no matter what that means. If that means restoring a relationship, great. If that means healing somebody physically, great. If that means bringing salvation to somebody, great. If that means baptizing somebody in the Holy Spirit, great. It really will be very broad. There will be a sense that through prayer and the laying on of hands, the miraculous can happen in people's lives. Defining miraculous here as beyond our expectations. And maybe that's the piece that the Holy Spirit churches offer in this conversation, is not the specific focus on miracles, which I think this text certainly challenges us to be open to. But I think the broader thing that the Holy Spirit churches offer us to is this expectation of something beyond our expectations, that we can't box it in, that we dare not box it in. Hmm. That, I think, is really the part of the, the Holy Spirit church's way of thinking in its best form is God wants to do something new and fresh and it can look however it needs to look. Yeah. This is where we've mentioned this, I think, before on the podcast that before we record, we always pray the same scripted prayer. And one salient line from that prayer really caught me today before we prayed it, and it's coming up again for me now. Grant to us that by thy holy inspiration, we may think those things that be good, and by thy merciful guiding may perform the same. And your invitation in this, I think, has been, let's pray, ask God, what does this mean? And God, make me open to it, meaning a whole lot of things. I think that that is a good thought. And now, you know, may we perform the same. May we actually go out and do that. That's uh, yeah. that's where the rubber hits the road. Yeah, I wholeheartedly agree. It, it, as long as this verse is interpreted within the highly relational father staying connected to the son, son staying connected to the father, the invitation for us to stay connected to both as long as it's staying within that, which I think is what prayer is all about, then I think we can't go too far wrong. Well, and I I agree with you. I think anything that pushes us toward relationship is the right way to go. I totally agree. But you know, one of the things I love about a text like this is that somebody could see something I'm not seeing. And so I want to use this as a moment to turn to our audience and say, what do you see in this text? Before we started talking about it, what was your sort of bent on interpreting a text like this? And then as you've been thinking about it over the last half hour or so, as we've been talking about it, do you have any new or fresh thoughts? And if so, what are they? What is this pushing you towards? Yeah. And once again, we really invite you to take this episode and share it with a friend. Use it as a starting point for your own conversation, your own discussion about, around this text. And may we perform the same. May we actually be praying for God to expand our worldview and expand our application of this. Yeah, exactly. Well, you know, I got to share another thought that I was thinking about already, kind of midway through our conversation. But I am confident there are other things you're thinking about as well. What else have you been thinking about this week? Well, all right. This is putting a lot of pressure on my thought because I feel like I got to like, I got to hold down the thought segment for both of us. <laughs> and uh, my thought is I actually stopped reading a book this week. It wow. might be. I know. It's like the third 
I think maybe third, maybe fourth book that I've ever just not finished and decided I'm never going to finish. And so that was B.F. Skinner's Science and Human Behavior. It's an old work. It's kind of a B.F. Skinner. Did my wife tell you to read this? Was this on, on her list of things you should read? No, I had told oh, okay. her, I, I said, hey, I want to read some of the foundational theorists. I want to read them on my own yeah. to get their perspective. And so I just kind of picked up this book, honestly, because I could find it in audio. Oh. No, nobody should read this book. It's not that his thoughts are bad. It's just that this was very highly influenced by the scientific method and cause and effect and his language in that book was so highly scientific and technical that it doesn't flow well as an audiobook. You really mm. have to dive into his operant conditioning th- mode of thinking. And it's just not interesting in the least. And I think we have taken what is valuable from Skinner and we have applied it where we need to, and we've left the rest behind. And that was, you know, 70 years ago. Uh, We very much moved on and we should have moved on. So I I think though he's still got some influence and where he's on, he's on. That's great. But I don't need to read this whole book to get that. Oh, it was so painfully dry. So, oh, well. And I am so proud of you right now. Yeah. You know? You well, can you do know, it, buddy. You don't have to finish the book. <laughs> I believe in you. It, it is so hard. So I like suffered for a month trying to read this book and then just avoiding my reading time because of it. And I'm like, I have so many books I want to read. This is not worth like throwing away my whole reading program just to try to get through this ridiculous book. So anyway, I ditched it and moved on and I am very happily reading again. That's awesome. You know, I realized while you were saying all of that, I have a random thought that I could throw in here if you want me to bolster our thoughts section and restore the status quo. Which is a way of saying you couldn't hold down the thought segment all by yourself. Uh, I'm going to help you out. No, I thought that was amazing. I, uh. <laughs> You know how much I will am excited about the fact that you didn't finish a book because our <laughs> our friendship is a long running conversation about the books you finished and the books I started. Uh, <laughs> and so that gives me great, great joy. Don't be fooled. Uh, All right. But I do want to throw this in because I think this is very interesting. All right, uh, go for it. I think I've mentioned before through a, a series of odd circumstances, my teenage daughter ended up at a different church than the rest of my family. And Mm -hmm. her church is going through this awesome idols series. And they have challenged the congregation during this idol series to significantly decrease their phone usage. And I am doing this with my daughter. And their challenge for this week, every week in the month, there's a special challenge. The challenge this week is brilliant. There is a way, at least on iPhones, to make the screen black and white instead of color. And when you make your screen black and white, it is far less pleasant to be on it. And it has been a really powerful reminder to me to spend less time automatically going on to my phone. So I am on my phone significantly less just because I made the screen black and white. And wow. props to the pastor for thinking that, of that. It is a brilliant, brilliant idea. And I wholly recommend anybody, everybody try it. Spend a week with your screen black and white. You will be on your phone less. You are not going to want to watch flick through stuff on Facebook as much. It's just not as interesting. You are not going to want to watch YouTube videos because they're just not as interesting. It's fascinating how impactful it has been. Hmm. Was that a Freudian slip or did you intend to call it space book? Oh, (laughs) if I said that, I didn't mean to. That was a Freudian slip. I I meant Facebook. I might have to 
call it space book because that's honestly when I'm on it, that's just what's happening. I'm just spacing out. Yeah. No, exactly. And I'll tell you what, all of those things you look at on Facebook, far less interesting in black and white. It's like, I oh, bet. this is boring now. Okay. Anyway, I just think that's brilliant. Absolutely. All right. Well, that brings us to our Witch Josh Ooh, question. Best part of the episode every time. Every time. Here we go. Witch Josh has had to get three different tetanus shots because he stepped on a rusty nail. Ooh, and that is me. Oh, man, that sounds painful. Yes. I only vaguely remember two of them, but I remember thinking each time it has happened, I can't believe I did that again. And so all three of them, I was on some sort of construction project. Like when I was in my early 20s, I was volunteering at the Providence Rescue Mission and we were doing a construction project and I had to walk over this pile of demoed wood and didn't have good, like I had like regular sneakers on and stepped full force onto a rusty nail. Oh. And yeah. And I have done this three times. I think I have learned my lesson at this point. And all three times that I have ever done this, I was just outside. I think a tetanus shot is good for 10 years. And I was just outside the window all three times. So I had to go get a tetanus shot each time. So the real question as to whether or not you've learned your lesson is how many years ago was your last tetanus shot? Because once you hit <laughs> that 10 year mark, we need to That's test you. When you'll find out. Uh, it's true. I don't remember when. The, so the last one would have been like maybe 11 years ago. So. In theory, I have actually learned my lesson so far. Okay. All right. We're in the window of proving it. Yes. If I come back next week and I have to get a tetanus shot. <laughs> oh. Uh, yeah, but for real. No, I think, I actually think I'm up to date on my tetanus shots. I think the last time it came up, I laughingly told the doctor this story and said, look, just give me the shot now because <laughs> I, I should have it because I am accident prone and it's just better for me to have it. So just go ahead and give me the tennis shot. Okay. All right. Well, may your feet stay away from rusty nails in the coming week. For real. Oh my goodness. With that pleasant image in mind, are you ready for another conversation next week? I am ready. Bring it on. All right. Well, I will talk to you then. All right. Bye. Bye. What's the car plan? <laughs> <laughs>